summer long, we've been talking about blockbuster stories. We've been talking about, if you're new to us, the stories in the Bible that that are fantastic, that are extraordinary, uh, that are amazing. And, and these are stories that I grew up hearing, probably many of you did as well, and so they are well-known stories, but we want to just take a moment and, and look at those stories again and allow God to speak to us in a new way and a fresh way. And I, I subtitled this, They're Great Stories That I'm Glad I Didn't Have to Live Through. Uh, stories like Jonah and the whale. How many of you are thankful you're not in the middle of a whale? Amen. I mean, there's a lot of things to be thankful for. That was one I never thought I'd have to worry about. Or the, the three Hebrew children being thrown into a fiery furnace. It's a powerful story, uh, but I'm glad I wasn't in there in the fire with the rest of them. And, and so this morning we want to drop into one of my absolute favorite stories. It's in 1 Kings chapter 18. We drop right into the story of Elijah, and there is so much. I just, I'm throwing this out beforehand. If you could see my original notes and my, my notes now, you would be so grateful that I'm not going to be as long as that. But there's so much in these stories that are, are powerful to our hearts. And so I want to begin reading about verse 16. And so what you need to understand coming into verse 16 of 1 Kings chapter 18 is that Elijah has appeared to a man by the name of Obadiah. And he's told Obadiah, who is a servant of King Ahab, take me to King Ahab. And, uh, and so with fear and trepidation, Obadiah goes in verse 16. It says, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him that Elijah was there. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when, when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Those are idols. Now summon the people from all over Israel to come meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people, and he said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut into, in, into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And then you call in the name of your God, and I will call in the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good, or amen, like you just did. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and they prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced before the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them, shout louder. He said, surely, you're, surely he's a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder, and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until the blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to the people, come here to me. And they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the Lord, the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seahs of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and, uh, and, and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. And the water ran down from the altar and filled every trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. 
Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trenches. When the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I want to I want to just talk to you briefly this morning about restarting a spiritual fire in your own life. I want to talk to you this morning about uh, becoming revived. And, and my message this morning is more than just a message for me. It's a prayer. It's a prayer that I've been praying for my own life through the course of this summer that God would release fresh fire into my own heart and my own spirit. But it's a prayer that I've been praying collectively for us a church as well, that collectively we would experience the presence of God again in ways that we have not or in ways that we once knew him in the past, but even greater ways in the days ahead. I I need to begin by saying we're living in hard days. I don't need to tell you that, but I need to tell you that. We're living in days when the very foundations of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a godly person is being challenged on, on every front. And if it were only politicians, well, we'd be used to that. If it were only the system around us, the godless system, well, we'd be used to that. But what has happened is now this godlessness has become so pervasive, so invasive, that it's begun to make its way into the church. It's begun to infiltrate religious leaders and spiritual leaders, men and women of God who at one time claimed the Word of God for their foundation are beginning to say things that are contrary to God's Word. They're beginning to dismiss the things that God has said. I was angered, I, I have to be honest, and I, I, I understand it, and I just was angered. I was in Africa, and I managed to turn on, I was trying to post some things to Facebook to let you know where we were, and someone who's a former college professor of mine, a Bible college professor, posted something to the internet that just made me so angry. As a man who has been a pastor and a man who has been a follower of Christ, I began to read the stuff of this article which was discounting everything that God's Word has to say. And, and he, it was an article by someone else and he wrote at the bottom, I'm beginning to wonder if this guy isn't right. And I read through it and I have, anyway, I, there was no scholarly value to the article. There was no biblical value to the article. It was completely contrary to anything that a person who can simply read the Bible for what it says would understand what God has to say. And I, I was just so, I didn't respond to it, but I was just so absolutely angered. And I'm not talking about, he wasn't talking about confusing subjects like the hyperstatic union. Some of you are trying to say, what is that? That's how Jesus was both God and man at the same time. I'm not talking about how God can be in the Trinity three persons and one, something that, that I get it, sometimes that's hard to understand. I'm talking about simple moral values, that the Bible is very explicit and very clear about, both in the Old and the New Testament, and that have been long settled. And, and I wrestled with that, but what made me even angrier were the posts that fell beneath it, people who are pastors, people who are claiming to be spiritual leaders, saying things that contradict what God's Word has to say. And it just reminded me of the words of Paul to Timothy when he said, in the last days, perilous times will come. When men will follow things that they're itching ears long after, where they'll turn away from what is true and they'll follow things that are false, things that sound, sound good to them in that time. And it made me realize that in this moment, as the people of God, we need to know what we believe. We need to know what God's Word says. And I'm not talking about being violent. I'm not talking about being malicious. I'm not talking about being harsh. I, I'm just talking about knowing the truth because only the truth can set you free. And, and, and so this morning, what we need more than anything else in my own heart is a, is a visitation of the Holy Spirit. What we as the body of Christ, corporate, cross Canada, across the world needs is a fresh encounter with God that causes us to know that He is holy and He is good, that causes us to know His Word powerfully, that it is truth in our lives. We need to experience Him intimately. We need the fresh, reviving work of God in our hearts that will make us unshakable, unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of God, as Paul said. So Jesus, as we just turn our thoughts to your word, in these next few moments, Lord, I pray that you will cause your word to be life to us. Lord, make our hearts good soil. Help us to hear what you need us to hear. Help us to know what you want us to know. Help us, Lord, to shape our lives according to your word and not according to our own desires. Lord, I pray that you would be, have the preeminence in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we started this series with a scripture from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. It's a, it's a very simple verse, but it reads this way, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Could you read that together with me? And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who comes to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. This is foundational to the Christian life. You cannot serve God and not understand that the righteous live by faith. It isn't God who must adjust to our understanding and our feelings. It is us who must adjust our understanding and our feelings to his word. We must allow God to be God and recognize that we are his servants. We are his creation. We were formed and fashioned in his image. I read this quote this past week and it made me say ouch. Go ahead and say ouch if you want to. It says this, the Christian challenges this this, that we have said a prayer but never made a decision to follow. We got baptized in water, but we never died to ourselves. We accepted Christ, but we never said no to sin. So we have altered our beliefs to match our experiences, which is why you think that you can be a Christian and still have sin as your master, why you can still live for yourself and still expect to be blessed, why you can say what you want and do what you want and not reap what you have sown. This is why. Amazing words. So I want to begin to... to, to to talk about the, this, this amazing Bible story. It, it, like I said, is one of the great blockbusters of Scripture. And, and it's this showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And what you need to know as we enter 1 Kings chapter 18 is that there are two kingdoms. Sometimes that's confusing if you don't know the history. But when Solomon passed, the nation of Israel split in two. There was the south called Judah and the north called Israel. And all the history of, of the people of God from that point on, the northern kingdom never had a good king. Never had a godly king. Never had a righteous experience. The kings tore down all the altars to God because they didn't want the people going back to the south to worship God and having faith in God. And so there was this constant effort on the part of the political leadership of the northern kingdom to keep people from knowing their God. So there we are. And the king at this time is a man by the name of King Ahab. And, and the Bible says that he was, the, was an evil king, but not just an evil king. He was the worst king. The worst king that the northern kingdom had known to that point, he did things that none of the other previous kings could have imagined. Under his leadership, idolatry, injustice, and immorality flourished. All manner of evil began to take place inside his country, and to add insult to injury, he married a woman by the name of Jezebel. Some of you know that name, and yes, she's as bad as you've heard. She was as bad and as evil as he was. She matched him in every way and then some. And together, the two of them filled the land with all kinds of all idols, idols that basically allowed for all kinds of sexual immorality, that allowed for all kind of greed and lasciviousness and sin to take root. Really, that was the foundation of idolatry in those days. It was just license to do whatever you wanted. And they set about to change the culture of the people of God. They set about to change the religious behaviors of the people of God, and, and the people followed, because after all, this was their king. After all, these priests of Baal and these priests of Asherah, these were the religious leaders of their country. No doubt the people felt, like many of us have felt at times, like we have no option. This is the way it is. This is the way our culture is going. These are the things that our culture has come to believe are true. And even if they violate everything we've known and grown up with, somehow there is this overwhelming sense that we have at times that, that there's just no hope. And so they began to follow the king and the queen and, and belief in God and his word simply became thought of as outmoded and impossible. 
And in the midst of this impossible moment, God begins to reach out redemptively to his people. He will not allow them to destroy themselves. He will not allow them to walk entirely away from him without a fight. He will not allow them to walk into this sin and degradation without some kind of a battle. And so he raises up this man, Elijah. And, and I love Elijah. I wish I had time to go into some of the history of Elijah. But Elijah sticks out like a sore thumb in Israel. He is, he is not of the political elite. He is not highly educated. He's from the hills in Gilead, which were well known to be hillbillies of the culture, people who are a little bit backward, people who are a little bit uneducated, people who are a little bit brash. They didn't have all the the shine and polish of cultured society. And for some reason, God in his infinite wisdom raises up this uneducated, unsophisticated, unpolitically correct, I don't think that's how you say that, unlearned backward man to set straight those who have great learning and great power. What he lacked in in sophistication, he made up for, though, with integrity and faith and determination. God said to Elijah, I want you to go to King Ahab, the king of your country. I want you to march into his presence, and I want you to tell him that from this day forward, there will be no rain until I send it. And then I want you to run for your life. And that's precisely what he did. This is why this is one of those stories I'm glad I didn't have to live through. Because the minute he announces to the king that there will be no rain and starts to run, a mad search goes throughout the nation and the nations around for Elijah. He becomes public enemy number one. His face gets posted on every lamppost and every post office everywhere. People, if you recognize this face, call in and we'll be there in a few moments. And I don't have time to walk through all of chapter 17 as Elijah flees for his life and how God provides for him through ravens and how God provides for him through a widow lady in Phoenicia. I don't have time to go through that, but I would love to tell you that God has this amazing way of providing for his people in the midst of crisis. That when all around is hell and chaos, when God's people honor him with all their hearts, there's this amazing truth that we find in Scripture that God provides, that God cares for, that God watches over. But that's for you to read on your own time. What is important for you to know is that according to, to old, the, the culture of the times, Baal, the god Baal was known as the sun god or the storm god. Basically, he was known to control or said to control all the elements and forces of nature, including rain. And so when Elijah stormed into Ahab's presence and said, there will be no rain, he was saying, my God says there's going to be no rain. Let's see what your God can do about that. And, and, and for three and a half years, here's the end result. There is no rain, not a drop of rain, not in Israel, not in Phoenicia, not in anywhere where God is not an, uh, honored. And the results are absolutely devastating. Uh, crops fail. Animals die. People suffer. And, and they go through this terrible season where there's no rain, no hope, no help. And in spite of three and a half years of not a drop of rain, Ahab's heart does not soften. And the people of Israel do not turn their hearts back to God. There's some indication, maybe some of them were starting to try, but they didn't want to go wholeheartedly because culturally it was wrong. And yet all around the situation is desperate. And so finally, God in his great mercy sends Elijah back to Ahab. And we've read this story. Elijah challenges Ahab to call the prophets to a contest. Let's finish this once and for all. Let's make sure no more innocents suffer. Let's have a a showdown on Mount Carmel, that place where God was once honored and worshipped here in the nation of Israel. Let's go to that place and figure out whose God is truly God. And Elijah says to Ahab, I'm going to give the advantage You can take all 450 of the prophets of Baal that are in the country. I want every one of them there. There's the advantage. 450 to 1. And if you can get them, which you can, you can send the other 400 plus prophets to Asherah. You can send those along too. I'll give you 1,000 to 1 odds here. You can march into that place with all the might that you want. And I'll meet you there. And, And everybody who's anybody comes to this contest. Ahab orders all the priests of Baal to show up, and they show up. And Elijah stands there as all the priests of Baal come through in their regalia. And the king rides through with his chariot and his horses and his men. And they all stand on one side, and on the other side there's this hillbilly. 
And in the midst of this moment, Elijah walks up in front of the people of God and he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you wonder whether or not God is God or Baal is God? How long will you worship idols? How long will you adopt the cultures around and try to think somehow that happened all through Africa? Don't be terrified. My entire team remembers that happening. Sorry, Wendy. Over and over and over again. Where was I? He says it's time to decide. It's time to decide whose God is God, and the people are silent. They're silent because of the massive might on one side and the simplicity on the other. They're, they're silent because they don't know which way to go. They're torn themselves between what is true and what is not true. They're wrestling themselves with whether that culturally we've moved beyond the Bible, whether we've moved beyond the things of God. They, they're wrestling with this because it's just this difficult difficult moment. What happens next is absolutely powerful. Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, you guys go first. There's 450 of you. Take the bull you want. You slaughter it whatever way you want. You put it on your altar whatever way you want, and you guys can sing and dance and shout and do everything you want. You can make all the noise you want. It's up to you. And they go and they do that. And here's the thing I need to tell you that, that probably they entered this battle defeated before they started. They probably entered that way because, you see, Baal is supposed to have sent rain, and they've been doing this for three and a half years, and he has never sent rain yet. They're starting to pray and sing and shout for all they're worth, but they know they've been doing that for three and a half years, and God has not responded one time in all of the three and a half years that they've been trying to get his attention. And now here in front of everybody, they're exposed. But they do what they're told because the king is sitting there and they sing and they dance and they shout and they cut themselves. And by noon, Elijah's having a time. And you read this. It's kind of funny. Elijah starts poking fun at them. He says, you know, you got to sing a little louder. I think he's sleeping. <laughs> sing a little louder. He's a bit indisposed probably. Probably just can't get to his thunder and lightning machine. And, and so sing a little louder. Cut yourselves a little harder. And they beat themselves and they do everything that they can trying to get it the attention of a God who is not a God, trying to get the attention of Baal, and absolutely nothing happens. Finally, evening comes, and they, in exhaustion, just collapse. And I love what happens next, because Elijah calls the people to himself in the same way that God is calling the people to himself. He invites the people of God to come a little closer. Come and see what your God will do for you. And as the people gather in, he sets about to rebuild an old altar that had been there before. He sets about to dig a trench around. And you could just, in my mind's eye, I can see him slowly moving, digging, shoveling. He doesn't necessarily want anybody's help because there's a specific way this has to be done. And so he slowly but surely kind of works his way around, makes sure the stones are in the right place, the wood is in the right place, the sacrifice is in the right place. He, he digs the, the trench where three gallons of water can go in and has them pour the water over it. And and then he simply prays one time, one time, and invites God to show the people that he wants to bring them back to himself. And fire falls. <laughs> and in an instant, the, the sacrifice is consumed, the wood is consumed, the stones are charred, the ground is charred, the water around the altar is burned up. In an instant, the power of God is so powerfully displayed that there can be no question about who is God. And I wish I could have been there for this exact moment as all the political leaders and all the well-educated people that have gathered for this moment to watch this hillbilly fail as they watch in that instant as God responds to the simple prayer of a godly man. And in that instant, they understand the reality. Why has there been no rain for three and a half years? Because God sends the rain. The power over everything belongs to God. Why has there been no blessing in our lives? Because blessing comes from God and nowhere else. Why has there been no joy in our country? Because joy comes from God. And there is no other source for it. Game, set, match, Jehovah God. And the people fall on their faces and they repent. 
And they say, the Lord is God. The Lord, he is the only God. The Lord, he is the only God for us. And what happens out of that moment is, is powerful and important for us this morning. Because as powerful as that moment is, most of you know Ahab's heart didn't change. The leadership in the country didn't necessarily change overnight. People didn't all of a sudden say, well, let's be a Christian nation, a, a Jewish nation. Over That didn't happen. What happened out of that moment with fire, though, was that the seed of uh, godliness began to be sowed inside that nation. God began to raise up a whole new generation of prophets in Israel. Suddenly, from this point on, we start reading about the, the schools of the prophets, people gathering to study God's word inside the nation of Israel, where kings and queens would continually fail and be wicked. There were men and women of God who wanted to know God, who were going to call his people back to himself, were, who were going to be people who would remind the nation that there is only one true God and that we should respond to him, live our lives for him. He is the God. God who answers by fire, performs miracle, who does impossible things. And that's important for us because it's what needs to happen in our nation. And I, I just wanted to talk to us for a moment because we are living in a time where the foundations of our belief systems are under attack. In every media system that there is, we're living in times where people are trying to, striving to challenge the very foundations of our faith. And here is what I need you to know. This is not the first time this has happened in history. This is not the first time that the enemy has risen up against the people of God and tried to crush the church and tried to crush those who had fallen. This is not the first time and it will not be the last. But every time in history when it has happened, when God's people know their God, when God's people know His Word, when we've grounded ourselves in His Word and we've made ourselves full of His Spirit, every time in the past when that has happened, we have met the challenges and we have overcome them in Jesus' name. And we will continue to. And I could walk you through the historical challenges. I could walk you through the moments of persecution and trouble. I could tell you about Rome who erected a column that said it's extinct anomena Christianorum, who said we're going to wipe out Christianity, but they failed today. Rome is a failed state, and today Jesus Christ is named by two billion people in the world. I could tell you all of that. But that instead, I want to simply challenge you this morning to do what Elijah did if you're struggling. If you're in the midst of a moment where you're battling in a faith crisis, if you're in the mo midst of a moment where there are all kinds of voices and you don't know which way to go, like Elijah said, you are wavering or staggering between two opinions. If that's where you are this morning and, and you're here like I am seeking God, can I just invite you to do what Elisha did? He did three things. The first is this. He refreshed the memory of God for the people. He refreshed their memory of who God was. And who God is. The Bible says that he rebuilt an old altar. An altar from their past. Verse 30 says he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. The kings had torn down those altars. They didn't want people following God. But Elisha marched out and he began to go to that very place where they knew God had been honored. That place where their fathers and their mothers and their grandfathers and their grandmothers had met with God. They went, he went to that place and he began to restore it as a place of faith as well. He took the time Time to refresh the place where they and their forefathers have met with God. And what I understand about this is simply this, when, when I need to connect with God, there's something powerful about remembering those moments in the past. There's something powerful about going into places. I don't know if you've done that, gone back to a place where you were a child and you walked in and I met God here. I encountered God here. Something powerful. And you stand in that same spot and you are reminded afresh of the goodness and the faithfulness of God, how he met you in a time of crisis. There is something powerful about that happening. And this is what Elijah did for the people and what I'm challenging you to do this morning through your mind, through your imagination. Go back to that place. Is there a place in the past where God has met you? 
Is there a place in your past, a time, a moment in your past where you were desperate for God? You went to an altar, you went to some place, and in that place you encountered God in a powerful way, and it kind of took your breath away for a moment, but it helped you to know that you knew that you knew that God was real, that He was for you, that He was with you. This is what God wants to do for us again. Elijah refreshed their memory of God. Secondly, he restored the foundation of their relationship with God. He not only brought them back to memory, he refreshed that thing, that, that the foundation of, of what was their relationship. In, in their case, it was the altar. In our case, it's God's word. But what grabs my attention is, is his attention to, to detail. He built the altar the way that God had prescribed in his word. And remember, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of hungry people waiting all around him. There are people staring at him, urging him to hurry up and, and demonstrate the power of God. But here's this alive taking his time stone on top of stone the Bible says 12 stones I'm finding 12 big stones they got to be the right size I'm putting them there the Bible tells me to order the wood in a certain way and so I put the wood in a certain way and the Bible says that the sacrifice has to be treated in a certain way and so I treat that sacrifice in a certain way and I put it on top of the altar and then he has water poured on and some scholars say the reason he did that was because the Bible says that offerings shouldn't be offered without salt and because there was salt water nearby they went and they got the salt water and they poured it over the, over the sacrifice over and over again to make sure that the laws of God were completely obeyed. And then the Bible says it came to be time for the evening sacrifice. And he waited till that moment. No cheat codes, no hurry ups, no speed ups. He waited till that precise moment when it was time. And he stood in front of the people of God and fire fell. And you know, in our lives as well, the journey to God is, is not the way we want it. We don't come to God on our own terms. We don't tell God that we have to, He has to accept our lifestyles or our patterns or our, our positions. We don't, we don't tell God how we come to Him. A relationship with God requires coming to Him by faith. It requires accepting what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. It requires us confessing those sins and accepting God's grace and forgiveness for the past and welcoming His Lordship into our lives. And when you do that, God comes. When you acknowledge who He is and you allow Him to be who He is in your life, it's in those moments that revival comes to our hearts. Lastly, He prayed for fresh fire. He invited God to, to restore His people. And that's what the fire represented. It represented a visitation of God amongst his people. God came and did a new thing. He responded to Elijah's faithful obedience, and he sent fresh fire to his people. Not old fire. It didn't come in the old way. It wasn't in the patterns of the past. God did something new in the midst of his people. And this is what I believe God wants to do in us right now, in the midst of our moment, in the midst of our situation. God wants to visit us. He wants to restore our souls. He wants to renew our faith. He wants to send fresh fire to the altar of our hearts. And if you've come in this morning, and I know it's summertime, it's the wrong time to preach this message. I got that. Because you all have places to go and people to see. But if you've come in this morning and you're tired spiritually, if you've come in this morning and maybe there's a battle in your own heart and you don't know whether you trust God for what's going on in your life or not. If you're in the, the place this morning and you have feel like God is a long distance away from where you precisely are, I want you to know that Jesus is here. That he's come this morning because he wants to reconnect with you. He wants to restore what has been worn down and broken down. He wants to revive what has become weak and broken in your life. He wants to encounter you in a new and a fresh way. Jesus is here. And so, Lord, in these next few moments, Lord, what is about to happen is not of me, it's of you. Lord, what you want to do has really nothing to do with anything I could have prepared to this point. I simply have tried to relay your word. But like Elijah, Lord, I pray over this congregation that, Lord, you would send fresh fire. 
that, Lord, in places where we have been dry and just accepted it, in places where there has been no blessing, no refreshing, no rain, and we've just left it and let it go, Lord, you would start a fresh thirst and a fresh hunger for you. Lord, in places maybe where there really has never been rain, where we've really never known you, we just know that we long for something we do not have. Lord, I pray in this place, in this moment, you would lose fire upon our hearts and our lives. And we would know, and we would know that you are restoring us back to yourself. Amen. Call you answer.